and we are discussing thermochemistry. Um, most of you in general chemistry, we talked about delta H. Uh, pretty much this unit, we're going to introduce not only H and calorimetry, but we're also going to talk about delta S, which is entropy, and delta G, which is Gibbs free energy. All right. So to get us started, um, we'll start with Roman numeral one, and we are going to be talking about energy this unit. That is a really fat pin. Alright, so energy uh, is the ability to do work. And this is the physics definition of energy. And essentially with physics, we might say that um, the ability to do work is simply to move matter and um, kind of as a uh, ability to do, do work and in physics this would be known as W work equals force times distance all right, so that is energy's kind of definition in physics, but we're not taking physics. So energy is the ability to do work, or, and this is really the chemistry um, meaning for energy, or transfer heat. All right, so there are several types of energy. Um, and these types are types you're familiar with probably since, I'm not sure, probably not your first science class, but probably as early as junior high, I'm guessing. Um, but types, really there's two main types. Um, the first one is kinetic energy. We're going to say Ke. And kinetic energy is simply the energy of motion. And that has not changed since you learned about it in junior high. And our definition for this, or our um, equation for this, is typically one half m v squared. Okay, and it has to do with um, if we take the temperature of something. The temperature is simply the average kinetic energy of that substance. Okay, um, and then the second type of energy, <coughs> if it's not kinetic, it is potential. I always call it P, but know that it is potential energy. And potential energy is uh, really stored energy. And instead of being energy of motion, it is known as energy of position. But stored energy, and it has to do with position instead of motion. Okay, so again, we, you may have seen this in junior high, was I have a, um, a nail, I'm holding it right here, um, it has potential energy, as soon as I drop it, it changed into kinetic energy, and now it's sitting on the table, it has potential energy again, if I knock it off the table, or it has potential energy, I knock it off the table, it has kinetic, it hits the floor, it then has potential again, if I were to take it to my stairs and drop it, so on and so forth. So position has to do with, it has a certain amount of potential energy here. If I raise it up, it has more potential energy. If I lower it, it has less potential energy. Again, that's not real helpful in chemistry. So in chemistry, when we talk about energy of position, we're really talking about um, atoms and molecules, or this really has to do with bonds, okay? And bonds store our energy in chemistry. Uh, the next thing we need to look at, just kind of as early definitions, is units. Okay, so how do we talk about energy? And the way we will talk about energy generally is joules. And joules is the metric unit, or the SI unit of energy. And with this, um, we have to, it's a derived unit. So if we go back to this equation, our 1 half mv squared, if this measures energy for us, if we put in our units for mass, all right, that is kilograms, 
and our units for V or velocity are meters per second, and we square that, we find that kilograms times meter squared over second squared is what joule comes from. Okay, So a joule e really equals a kilogram meter squared second squared. The other unit that we talk about quite a bit is the calorie. And I'm going to use lowercase here, and I'll show you why in a second. But calorie is kind of the traditional unit. Um, it was the English unit. So just like we have inches and we have um, whatever feet, calories just they carry over from the English um, way of measuring stuff. And calories are defined as the energy needed to raise one gram H2O by one degree Celsius. All right, and that is how big a calorie is. So if you can imagine one uh, gram of water, which would be a milliliter of water, raising at one degree, a calorie is not a whole lot. So usually we don't talk about calories, we usually talk about kilocalories. And calories are important because we usually count them in America. So we have another unit that is capital C calories. And that is the calories that we eat. All right, so whenever you are on a 2,000 calorie diet, you're not really on a 2,000 calorie diet, you're really on a 2 million calorie diet because these calories are equal to 1,000 little c calories. And again, just because calories are so very small, it's impractical to talk about single little c calories. Okay, so a calorie is equal to 1,000 calories. Um, it's also equal to one kilocalorie. And then the relationship between calories and joules is one calorie equals 4.184 joules. And again, these will be on your equation sheet, so you don't need to memorize them, but just kind of know their relationship with each other. All right, the next big topic we're going to talk about is the first law of thermodynamics. And the first law of thermodynamics basically says that energy is neither created nor destroyed. So first law of thermo. First law of thermo. Um, it is known as the law of conservation of energy. So conservation of energy. And as far as the law of conservation of energy goes, uh, kind of just a couple, again, definitions to get straight. Um, it's also known as um, energy is neither created nor destroyed. All right, energy is always conserved. Uh, sometimes, depending again on what science you're in, it might be called the law of conservation of mass, uh, which is why we balance equations. Um, and there is a relationship between energy and mass. If energy is conserved, mass must also be conserved because of our good friend, Mr. Einstein. E equals mass times the speed of light squared. If the speed of light is a constant, even if the speed of light changes, we've seen that in the news recently, um, it's still a constant. So this is always the same. So energy is directly related to mass. All right. So a couple things is, um, in the law of conservation of energy, we have what we call the system and the surroundings. And the system is any well-defined portion of the universe. All right. So any well defined well defined portion of universe and generally this would be a beaker a flask um, a um, I'm not sure <coughs> maybe even a greenhouse if we were talking about you know kind of a bigger system but really in science it's going to be a test tube a beaker a flask 
but it's a well-defined portion of the universe. And the surroundings are everything else. So if we're talking about the surroundings, um, or if we're talking about the universe, um, the surroundings encompass a whole lot. Surroundings equal um, all else. Okay, so system and surroundings. Um, and then we can really have two systems, an open system and a closed system. In an open system, two things are true. So open system. Um, energy and matter. So I'm just going to say E and M. Energy and matter can be exchanged. Or I might say transferred. Can be transferred. I don't know if my E's are not writing correctly every time. So energy and matter can be transferred between cis and surroundings. Okay, that is an open system. And open systems are fairly impractical because um, we can't really isolate if our energy is changing, is that energy due to the mass, or is that energy due to the, um, or is the heat? Is um, heat is what we're going to be concerned about? Because um, if we go back up to our definition in chemistry, we want to know about the transfer of heat. All right. So is heat due to the energy itself, or is heat due to the matter? So really, in chemistry, we are concerned more about closed systems. And in closed systems, only energy is transferred. Only E is transferred and mass stays in the same spot. Alright, the last kind of bullet point on tonight's notes is going to be internal energy. So internal energy is what we are concerned about and hopefully what we are able to measure and calculate. So internal energy, uh, which we are just going to call E, is the total, or we might say the sum, of Ke, kinetic energy, and potential energy in our system, or in a system. All right, so internal energy E is the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy in our system. And kind of a couple of things. Delta E then is just like delta always means, is our final energy. minus our initial energy. All right. <coughs> and this E, uh, because we can't because we cannot measure energy directly, is really unmeasurable. Most of the time, we know what the change is, but these E's are not reliable, they're not exact, they're not precise. Okay, So this E is somewhat unreliable. However, this is always going to be true. If our delta E is a positive value, energy is entering our system. Okay. So energy is gained from surroundings. And we call that endothermic, because heat is going into the system. And the same is also true, or the converse is also true. 
if our delta E is negative, energy is lost to surroundings. And if it's lost to surroundings, it is known as exothermic because heat is going out of the system. So know that endo and exo refer to the system itself. All right, and then the very last bit of our notes is going to be number two. So if this is unmeasurable, um, what is a way that we can actually measure energy in our system? So delta E can also equal Q plus W. All right, which makes sense because Q is heat and W is work, which relates right back up to our first definition. What is energy? Energy is the ability to do work or transfer heat. So in some reactions, both of these things occur. All right, um, these questions are going to be um, likely out of your book. I think you have two questions on your test that relate to this kind of concept. And really beyond this, everything that we're going to talk about is simply Q equaling E, all right, that our work is going to be inconsequential. So Q is heat gained or lost. And heat gained is going to be a positive Q, heat gained or lost, and heat lost is going to be a negative Q, just like our um, endo and exothermic. And W is going to be work done by, or, or really we can have positive or negative W. So W is work. done by surroundings on system. Okay, so if our surroundings do work on our system, it is positive work, okay, or positive energy. And this is typically, and this will make more sense in just a second, a contraction of our system. And then work can also work can also be the opposite, where work can also be done by system on surroundings. And if our system is doing the work, it is losing energy or it is expanding. All right. All right, lastly, work equals negative P delta V, where volume is really what is contracting or expanding, all right? And on page, let's see, 230 in your book, um, example 6.1 has an excellent, excellent, excellent example and explanation of how this is calculated. All right. Uh, the other big thing to say is if we are pushing against a vacuum, um, the interesting thing um, is if you talk, I think, to physics people, this ability to do work, work equals force times distance. It is never distance laterally. Okay. So if I have this pin in my hand and I push this across my hand, I'm doing no work Okay, because there's no real resistance going this way. But if I pick it up, that is work because I am lifting against gravity. All right. So um, in this example 6.1 that I'd like you to look at, um, it kind of talks about. Um, I think the first example is against a vacuum and no work is done um, because work has to be done against some sort of thing. Okay. Um, as part of your ex as part of your um, summary, if you could give me the answer to the practice exercise in that same kind of brown box practice exercise uh, right after example 6.1 in the brown box. All right, that is it. Um, I hope you had a nice weekend, and I will see you on Monday.